Welcome to Ghostly. Is the Stanley Hotel haunted? Ghostly is a podcast that comes out every other week. In each episode, we take a ghost story or paranormal event and look into its complete history. Rebecca then gives us evidence proving that the story is real. And my job is to debate those pieces of evidence and get you, the listener, prepared to vote on if it's real or not. If you haven't yet, please hit that subscribe button. And as always, we're your host. I'm Pat. And I'm Rebecca. What's been going on, Rebecca? Well, uh, it's been hard to do much of anything, but I wanted to share that with the weather. <laughs> Sorry, that's why it's been hard to do anything because as we've all been frozen, though we are thawing finally. Uh, but I just wanted to share some friends of mine. We love to watch horror movies. You know, we do like a horror fest. I think I've mentioned this before every year. Obviously, with everything going on, that hasn't happened. But we have instituted a twice a week or not twice a week, every two week horror movie night because you know all those streaming services now have like watch parties oh yeah so we can get together and catch up on all these horror movies that we've missed in the theater Mm. streaming all of that stuff it's really great we should do a cobra kai watch party (laughs) yes you would like a cobra (laughs) kai watch party we'd have to start with the original karate kid Uh, of course our way into it yes watch every single one So, have you guys watched The Shining as one of your movies? Uh, you know what? We haven't, but we've all seen it. Oh, okay. certainly that's that's a classic that's out there, yeah. and uh, I'm very excited that that's a part of this episode today. Oh yeah, because yeah. it's your favorite movie. No, what? I'm sorry. I'm one of I'm I I'm kind of like Stephen King. I don't think that the movie is the best version of his book. However, you don't I, like Jack Nicholson. <laughs> I will say I did rewatch it because obviously this episode and I will say I liked it better because I think Uh, it's been a while since I read the book. So I was a little more open to the changes and could see it a little bit better. Uh, But yeah, it wasn't quite as mm. I mean, you know, the the book's always better. Yeah. 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 Now, how about you? What's been going on with you? Ooh, uh, I have been putting together a secret project for Ghostly. Secret project for Ghostly. Yeah. It is called Ghostly Radio right now. Okay. That's what it is. And what what it is, is we have, we tried to do an internet radio station before for Ghostly. Yes. But the service was horrible. It would only play the last three episodes that we did. Mm. And it didn't allow us to choose anything or, or like pick any times for anything. Well, I found another service that is really cool and it allows us to do it. And not only does it allow us to do it, we might be able to bring in some other paranormal shows. Oh, nice. So like a, a full 24-7 oh, ghostly yeah. slash paranormal podcast our paranormal friends. Radio, yes. Our para friends. Para friends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, if you want to check that out, it's it's in its beta beta stages right now. There you go. Yeah. It is ghostlypodcast.com slash radio. Yep. And we'll put a note in the show links. Or show notes. Sorry. You will put a link in the I show notes. I will put a link in the show notes <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> on mm-hmm. it. And uh you should definitely go check it out. Let us know what you think. I know a lot of you listen to Ghostly while you work. And if you just want to have that on as like your mindless background, yeah. and you don't even have to pick which episodes, like it'll do it for you. It's but kinda also fun. we could have like special events on there. Oh, we could. We could record special things that'll just yeah. be on the radio. That's, you know, going to happen in the future. Right now we just have like 20 something episodes up there and uh, just going on a loop and I'll be adding more. And as I said, we've already contacted some friends. And they're interested. Yep. Going to be good. So we should really get into this episode. Uh, This is going to be a huge episode. Yes. Um, But before we do that, um, we have some shout outs. We do. So there are two ways to get a shout out on Ghostly. The first way is to give us a review on Apple Podcast. We always prefer the five star reviews, of course, but we will read any and all reviews that we receive. Yes. And the second way is to either buy us a coffee on buyusacoffee.com slash ghostlypodcast or by going to our website, ghostlypodcast.com, and hitting the buy us a coffee uh, in the menu. Or by becoming a member on Buy Me a Coffee for Ghostly. Yes. So today we have both. We do. We do. So I'll I'll go first. Okay. Um, so on uh, Buy Me a Coffee, uh, Jeff Larchick. Um, 
was kind enough to buy us some coffees. And yeah, we've been fantastic. in contact with Jeff for months now. Yeah, he always sends us really creepy pictures he takes in the middle yeah. of the woods. Yes, um, but uh, we do not have permission to share those. Yet, no, not so. yet, not yet. But uh, but we do appreciate the coffee. Okay, so we do have. Two five star reviews on Apple Podcast as well. We have D Molson eighty nine. Uh, he says it's one of his favorite podcasts. Mm. Uh, coming out of a visual age filled with fast moving high tech special effects, lights, explosions, and into a calm, relaxing escape from reality with a mix of history. Two voices with the audible chemistry to help. You kick back and leave your daily stress behind. An opportunity to slip into the spooky while being tethered to the science and history. To pull you back when you get lost. Pat and Rebecca truly know how to entertain, inform, and bicker in the best of ways. Keeping the listener engaged and waiting for the next episode. Not only are, are they voices behind the mic but also personable and interactive throughout their social media outlets. This podcast is by far one of my favorites and one that I share with friends and family every chance I get. The amount of effort put forth into each episode, visual, visuals, promos, content, and top-notch audio quality is well noticed and places them at the top of my podcast list. Definitely worth the time to slow down your day, kick back, and enjoy. You will thank yourself later. Thank you to Pat and Rebecca for doing all that you do and giving us the chance to escape. Cheers. Ah, oh, very nice. Wow. Yeah, that was really nice. Uh, the second review th that we got is a Canadian review. Oh, um, hey there. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it, it doesn't show up on Apple Podcast for the people in the States or any place else but Canada. Uh, just so you know if you're trying to find it. Uh, this one is by Menacing Burglar. It says, amazingly spooky. Most paranormal podcasts are very one-sided, but this one isn't. The two hosts take turns debating how real those ghost stories are. And then they let the fans decide in the polls what they think. They also read the fans' ghostly experiences or what they thought was ghost, but turned out to be something else. I try to be a skeptic, but generally I'm a believer. There you go. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So uh, do we have any listener mail? We do. We do. Um, so this one is an actual letter oh i don't know if you can hear the letter part of it um but the, <laughs> you know we did ask for physical mail and we do love that yes and this is one that has been um that has been foretold by jacob yes yes he did now i don't know to be honest i actually have a theory a different theory of of this mail that what? we've received so not anything we are talking about on air right now Okay. But <laughs> TBD, <laughs> if anything mm -hmm. comes from that. All right. But this is from uh, Marisol, who we've okay. had uh, contact with before. So thank you so much for sending this. Uh, she's got two stories. So I'm going to, you know, read one this week and then another one. And next she's time. also a member of the book club. She is. So yeah, yeah if you want to join the book club, definitely go to ghostlypodcast.com slash book club. Yeah. Yep. All right. I wanted to. So hello, Pat and Rebecca. I wanted to send you a bona fide piece of mail and tell you a couple of weird things that have happened to me and my son in my house. Now, I want to preface this with I am a hashtag team in between. And thank you. <laughs> thank you, Marisol, for using the correct term. By being a tweeny. You really don't want to be called that. <laughs> Just letting you know. <laughs> hashtag team in between. I want to believe, but I just don't really think it's true. The mm. paranormal, clairvoyant, spirituality, sensitive folks. I think it would be awesome, and hopefully one day I can feel that it is. Anyways, here are my two weird, unexplainable stories. Both of my stories have happened in the same room, my bedroom. The first one is the most recent, which happened about two months ago. My son, three and a half, on several times has told me, quote, there's a, there's a tiny boy, and he, it lives under my bed 
and or under my chest of drawers. I ask my son if it wants to play, and he tells me that the boy is not nice and mean. I've asked him to tell me what it looks like, and he just says that the boy is dark, tiny, and not nice. Wait, okay, so when we're talking tiny, are we talking like action figure size, or are we talking like there's a very young child? I think he just means young, but I don't know. I mean, that's a great question. I do not... We, the, the three and a half year old did not give us a frame of reference for what <laughs> okay. tiny is. Um, so, okay. Uh, when he brought this up to me randomly three different times, I thought it was creepy, but I just thought he's three and he has an evolving imagination. Well, fast forward to about three weeks after the first time I heard about this tiny dark boy in my room, something more happens. My son was sitting on the floor in front of my bed, quietly watching a cartoon, and all of a sudden he jumps up and screams and cries. He runs to me and jumps on me and tells me the tiny boy moved the hair from his ear and hissed or went, mmm. Before I go further, he wasn't watching anything spooky. He was watching Peppa Pig, which I'm sure all of you parents know exactly what that is. I don't know what Peppa Pig is. It's a Is it scary? No. Oh, okay. (laughs) <laughs> this is, So this kid is crying. Us moms and dads know when your kid is pretend upset and actually upset. And this was the latter. He took longer to calm down than normal. And then he would bring it up often. A month later, he was talking about this. I don't know what happened, but whatever did happen, he felt it intensely. Ooh. There you go. Now, how many pages is this letter? Uh, it's about four pages. So we've wow. made it through. We the, the next one is even longer. So. Whoa. I'm excited for that one. Okay. Well, uh, how how can people tell us their stories? Yeah. Well, you know, the easiest way is just to email us. Okay. Email us at info at ghostlypodcast.com. Super easy. Or if you just go to ghostlypodcast.com, there's a contact form, right? Yeah. Right there. You just hit the contact us. And, and fill it out. Yeah. Or they can call us at 630-448. 2138 and leave a voicemail. Yeah, if you're like, I cannot type this out. Yeah. Call. Just put it on the voicemail. And if you're driving right now and you can't jot down that phone number or the address we're going to give you in a second, you can always go to our website, ghostlypodcast.com and scroll to the bottom. You'll find all that information right there in the footer. You got it. And our uh, if you do want to send us a physical piece of mail, like we just (laughs) were reading to you, you can send it to P.O. Box 264 in Geneva, Illinois, 60134. All right. So now it's time to do the polls. Yeah, this is your favorite part, right? Uh, Well, I mean, I'm expecting to lose badly in this one, so I've gotten over it over the last couple of weeks. Well, you won last time, so... Yeah, but this one was different. I gave it a three overall, so... Yeah. How can I expect other people to not think that it's paranormal? <laughs> well, so our last episode was near-death experiences. And you are correct, Pat. Uh, yeses were 73.1% and noes were 269 Yeah, and I believe it would have been 100% yes had you worded the question differently. Interesting. Because you asked if near-death experiences are paranormal. Mm-hmm. And... I don't know if I necessarily would say that they're paranormal. I would say that they are, you know, that there's something about them. But I don't know if paranormal is the right word. Uh, right? But, you know, ghostly is about the paranormal. So that's what I wanted to test. And yeah. I still won. So how would they go about answering the poll for this episode? You're going to go to ghostlypodcast.com and click on polls. Okay. That's, that's it. it. Again, everything's there. Yeah. If you just go to the website. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, Okay, so now it's time to get into the episode. Um, And when most people that are into the paranormal hear the name Stanley Hotel, they either think of it as one of the most haunted hotels in the world, or they think of the movie The Shining, right? Those are the two things you think of. Easily. I actually don't remember even watching the movie The Shining until recently, until we decided to do this episode. But once I did see it, I became a little obsessed with its implied history throughout the movie. I mean, the pictures at the end of the movie really gave birth to the need for me to know more about this enormous hotel. It's 11 buildings. Did you know that? I did. It's, uh, yeah, it's, this is, a, we, 
it's a big scope of, of a story. It is, definitely. So Rebecca had suggested this episode early on, but I think I didn't really know the scope of this hotel. I, I didn't know how big it was. I didn't know that it had such a such a history. I mean, it's crazy. But now I'm super excited about doing this episode, and I think that we should have done this a lot earlier than we actually are. Uh, there's just so many stories that we want to tell you all that sometimes the good ones get pushed back a little bit. Yes, I will make the note that so, I have been suggesting this episode for a while. Absolutely, you have been. So <laughs> get ready for probably one of our spookiest episodes. Yeah, I would easily, easily. Do you, do you have anything to add to this? Um, well, you know, I would just say, so I, yeah, this has definitely been on my list for a while. And one of the reasons is, so a while ago, kind of at the beginning of pandemic times, uh, we did a series of live uh, p- paranormal panels, which, you know, we'll see if that ever happens again. Uh, but one of the, I think the last one that we did was on haunted hotels. Yes. So if you are into haunted hotels, there'll be a lot of people that talk about those. Go check that episode out. Uh, it was released as a bonus, I believe. It was a bonus episode. It was our last one. Yeah. yeah. So, um, but as part of that, when you look up like scariest hotels in the United States... The Stanley Hotel shows up on every list. Yeah. And as soon as I saw it, I was like, this is amazing. And I, but I didn't want to do it as part of the panel because I knew um, it needed its own episode. <laughs> sure. Definitely. <laughs> um, but, anyways, but please, uh, please note again, a lot of us ask, a lot of people ask us to do a special on haunted hotels. Just, you know, go check out that bonus episode and know that haunted hotels are going to be a regular or, or have been and will continue to be a regular part of the ghostly episode yes so i mean what we kind of do is we kind of mix in all these things you know we kind of want to do presidents and we want to do hotels and we want to do haunted places and stuff like that people and yeah so uh, we try to space them out a little bit so everyone gets what they're looking for absolutely and and definitely share with us any ideas that you have we love your suggestions Speaking of everyone getting what they're looking for, do you have a ghost story for us? Of course. All right, let's hear it. It's time for a spooky tale from Rebecca. I haven't had a lot of paranormal things happen to me. I mean, maybe a few times I felt a weird presence or heard a weird noise I couldn't totally explain, but I never really thought much of it. But one exception happened a few years ago when my boyfriend and I stayed at the Stanley Hotel in Colorado. We had heard how beautiful it was and that it was haunted, so we decided to check it out. It was pretty commercial looking when we first got there. I mean, they've added all these things from the movie The Shining, like a cutout of the creepy twins you can take a picture with. They also have a ghost tour every night. I mean, it was fun, but I totally did not think anything would happen. We had a great day exploring this big, beautiful hotel and then took the night tour. It was fun. And we saw these underground caves that supposedly have limestone and quartz that like capture and spread the paranormal energy. But I mean, nothing happened. I guess they did this thing with these flashlights in the concert hall. They seem to go on and off by themselves. The guide said it was this ghost named Paul, a man who used to work there. I don't know, though. It's just it seemed like something that could be faked. But it was fun and really great to hear about the history. We finally went to bed pretty late. We were staying on the fourth floor. And earlier on the tour, we heard this was a popular spot for activity. So I guess maybe we were primed to see something. But I had really dismissed most of it. So had my boyfriend. We didn't hesitate to turn off the lights and go to sleep. Around 3 a.m., I woke up and heard something. It sounded like footsteps and dragging upstairs from us, like someone moving furniture. At first, I was annoyed, and then I thought, uh, why would someone be moving furniture at 3 a.m.? Plus, there isn't a fifth floor above us. Just as I was about to wake my boyfriend up, it stopped. You know, I decided maybe something had gotten on the roof and it was gone now. I made it back to sleep, but just a half hour later, I was woken up by my boyfriend saying loudly, I wish they would stop running. I asked, what's happening? He said, don't you hear them? 
kids running up and down the hallway. Parents need to get control. Maybe I just need to call downstairs. No, I said, I don't want to get them in trouble. Let's just go out there and tell them to stop. Because I did hear them too. We heard children running and laughing outside our room in the hallway. So I got up and I went to the door. As I opened it, I felt my heart stop. The noise stopped and there was no one in the hallway. No kids, nothing. No other guests looking to, out to see the noise. No hotel staff coming to tell them to quiet down. Just nothing. I felt the air getting heavy. It felt a bit op- oppressive. So I closed the door and I went back to the bed. My boyfriend asked, why didn't you say anything? It took me a few minutes to get my composure enough to tell him what I saw or I guess what I didn't see. To this day, he thinks it's just that they ran off and went somewhere else, but he wasn't at that door. It was such a fast turnaround. And that oppressive feeling? No, I, Allison, I don't know what happened, but whatever it was, there is no easy explanation. Wow, so <clears throat> how much of this is real? You know, it's not a specific story that I am read or anything, but it's based on reports. Mm. Reports of room 401? Um, 401 is is one of the most popular ones, but they, they do, the fourth floor just in general mm. is is uh, where people will hear children, hear laughing, footsteps, yeah. dragging from upstairs. But I didn't see that you used 401 in your evidence. No, I just used the fourth floor. Again, 401 is okay. is a room. But let's revisit that. We will. When it comes time for the debate, because I got some stuff to add to that. Okay. Um, okay, well, I guess we should take a break, and then we'll get into the history, which is really fascinating. Definitely. So here at Ghostly, we have a new sponsor, Sinister Coffee and Creamery. Yeah, Sinister Coffee and Creamery is a shop in Portland owned by an amazing couple, Kelly and Michelle, who are also super into the paranormal and do their own investigations in addition to making amazing coffee. What's really cool is that they pick their coffee names to give insight into the deeper meaning behind supernatural and paranormal terminology. Our favorite blend is Apparition. It's a medium roast with delicious chocolate oats. And Ghostly listeners get 10% off when they use the code GHOSTLY10 on their order at SinisterCoffeeAndCreamery.com. And that will be in our show notes, too. It will. So order some today and enjoy a little ghost with your coffee. All right. Time for hashtag pet facts. So the Stanley Hotel has a really interesting history. Even before the Stanley Hotel was even thought of, the Native American tribes from the area used Estes Park as their hunting grounds. It's just 10 miles from the Rocky Mountain National Park. Uh, So I wondered why they called it Estes Park. Yeah, that is kind of an an odd name. Right? Yeah. Um, The reason why it's called Park is because park meant valley back in the early days. So it was the valley before the mountains. And Estes was the last name of the first Anglo-Saxon settler in the area, Okay, which there's not much history about Estes Mm -hmm. himself. Um, But back when Colorado was first being settled around 1862, an American citizen could claim 160 acres of land in what was uninhabited land at the time. Okay. Um, so Windham Thomas Windham Quinn, the fourth <laughs> Earl, 
the Wyndham is spelled differently both times, by the way. Oh, I see that. Yeah, that would be uh, interesting. He's the fourth Earl of Dunraven and Mount Earl. He saw Estes Park as a very lucrative area. He wanted to turn the area around the Rocky Mountains into a sort of playground for his rich hunter friends. The only issue was that he was not an American citizen. He was from Ireland. So he couldn't claim the land. Mm. So what he did was he hired anybody that he could find. And they would claim the land and then sell it to him on the cheap. So he ended up with 6,000 acres. 31 people claimed land. Wow. And again, you know, this is where Native Americans, were. they were hunting yeah. there. <laughs> yeah. But, but it's what happened. But in order to claim the land, these people had to build something on there, like a structure on there. So they devised this plan to put together four logs and just lay it on the ground. And that was their building. Very, very sketchy. <laughs> it is very sketchy. Yeah, exactly. Um, so in in 1878, the Earl erected a hotel called the Estes Park Hotel. This hotel served as the grounds for the Earl and his rich hunter friends. It was super fancy for the 1870s. Okay, so this was not just the logs on the ground. No, no, okay. no, no. No, he took down all the logs on the ground and <laughs> he built it into something more. But in 1911, the hotel caught on fire. There weren't any fire departments in this area at that time, so it burnt down and was never rebuilt. The Earl sold the land to Freeland Oscar Stanley, a.k.a. Etho Stanley, and his twin brother, Francis Edgar Stanley. They're both bearded men, so I felt I, I feel like a kinship with them. Gotcha. The Stanleys were from Maine. Uh, Freeland had made his fortune in the manufacture of photographic plates. So really started, um, like, was one of the first dry photographic plates. Oh, interesting. Yeah. In 1904, they sold their business to the Kodaks. Uh Aha. Have you ever heard of Kodak? I have. (laughs) Some people nowadays, some of the younger (laughs) generation, they may not have. Yeah. Uh, The Stanley boys as I'm going to call them, I guess. Okay. <laughs> the Stanley boys had a long line of businesses. In 1859, at the age of nine, Freeland and Francis started their first business together, refining and selling maple sugar. Okay, so they were definitely entrepreneurs. Oh, maybe. definitely, definitely. They also had a fairly successful motor carriage business. They invented the Stanley Steamer, which sounds like a vacuum cleaner, but was actually a steam-powered car. Isn't there like a vacuum like the Stanley Steam carpet cleaner. Sorry, I didn't pay us any money. I, don't know. I have no idea. I'm, and that probably has nothing to do with it. But and they are not sponsors of Ghostly Podcast. They are not. Anyway. <laughs> but if they want to be, <laughs> they could just reach out to us, there and we'd be go. happy to sponsor them. Um, so back in those days, it wasn't really clear what kind of engine would win out in the automobile industry. There was three different kinds. There mm. was gas. There was electric, which was battery-powered, still is, and steam-powered cars. They actually broke the land speed record in the early 1900s. The car that broke the record for them was known as the Flying Teapot. Wow. So this was with a steam engine. They were the fastest. Yeah. Wow. So maybe we should go back to that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, and I have heard, you know, how there were, we were so close to going electric and we didn't. Yeah, yeah. very close. But the Stanleys didn't keep up with modern innovations with the Stanley steam car, so probably the reason why steam cars are not what we drive nowadays. Uh, The business kind of died out. In 1903, Freeland was stricken with tuberculosis. The most highly recommended treatment of the day was fresh, dry air with lots of sunlight and a hearty diet. He decided to give the Rocky Mountains a try. That eventually led him and his wife Flora to Estes Park. And we've talked about that with tuberculosis and some of our institutions, places that yeah. we've talked about before. Yeah, but this place seemed to have a healing energy. Um, so anyways, we'll talk more about that later, I think. Uh, Estes Park was the one place that Freeland's health actually started to improve dramatically. Uh, he was so taken with the beautiful land and its magical healing powers that he decided he would return every year. 
This is some of the reason why they believe there's so much paranormal activity at the Stanley Hotel. It's the quartz crystals, I guess. Mm. They believe it has healing energy, too. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Um, By 1907, he had decided that he wanted to turn Estes Park into a resort town. So he began construction of the Hotel Stanley, which was actually going to be called the Dunraven Hotel. Oh, because of Wyndham Wyndham. Yeah, Wyndham Wyndham, (laughs) Wyndham Wyndham Q, or whatever his name was, a Quinn, Wyndham Thomas Wyndham Quinn, um, because they were kind of in like a competition with them. Oh, okay. Yeah, so, uh, but the town would not allow him to call it that. Mm. So they ended up calling it, naming it after themselves, the Stanley Hotel. So they hired a team of 300 men for the construction of the 11-building Stanley Hotel. Men were working around the clock to get the hotel built and operational as quickly as possible. The main hotel and concert hall were completed in 1909 and the manor in 1910. To bring guests from the nearest train depot in the foothill town of Lyons, Colorado, Stanley's car company produced a fleet of specially designed steam-powered vehicles called mountain wagons that seated multiple passengers. Stanley operated the hotel almost as a pastime, remarking once that he spent more money than he made each summer. The first guest to the Stanley Hotel, this is, this is really funny to me, uh, the first guests to the Stanley Hotel were actually pranked. <laughs> so imagine all these East Coast people coming to Colorado for the first time. They had never seen a bear before. Well, on the road to the hotel, they saw their first bear, and they screamed out from the Stanley steam car as the bear started to charge them. The driver says, this happens all the time, and whips out his pistol to shoot the bear. But the pistol was fake, and so was the bear. It was a man dressed in a bear costume. That's fantastic. Did they ever <laughs> tell them that it was all fake? Or... Yeah, yeah, they oh. found out. Yeah, he okay. took off his mask oh, okay. and yeah. they all got a good laugh, I guess. <laughs> um, so this was not at the exact same location as the Earl's Hotel. That had, okay, that we talked about earlier. Yeah. Gotcha. But it was fairly close. The Stanleys built their resort by trying to one-up the Earl. Their hotel would beat the Earl by making it fully electric with gas-powered backups. They built. They actually built a hydro plant on Fall River to supply the electricity to the hotel. So the fire in 1911 was the last straw for the Earl, and he sold the Stanleys his land. So remember, it was 6,000 acres. Right. Yeah, and probably sold it at pretty cheap because nobody was really around there. Um, but there was also a fire at the Stanley Hotel, and I'm not sure if it's the same fire as was on the Earl's property. Mm. It seems a coincidence that they both happened in 1911, but I can't find any evidence linking them. Hmm. Um, But the story goes that they had backup gas power to the electricity. On June 25th, the day after the pipes were filled, the backup system was to be tested because there was a storm that knocked out the electricity to the hotel. So they gathered all the guests to the lobby area, and when they went to light the backup gas... There was an explosion that injured a maid and damaged structures of the Stanley Hotel. Okay. So a brief article telegraphed to the York Dispatch of York, Pennsylvania, and circulated by the Associated Press. I didn't even know the Associated Press was around then. Oh, yeah. It's been around a long time. Um, The following day said this. The Stanley Hotel, built at a cost of $500,000, was partially wrecked last night by an explosion of gas. Eight persons were injured, one seriously— None of the guests were injured. Elizabeth Wilson of Lancaster, Pennsylvania, a hotel employee, was hurled from the second to the first floor, and both ankles were broken. So the Stanley used a lot of the Earl's land combined with their own to help build out Estes Park, the town. They started the first bank in the area and donated other portions of the land for the first school. And by the way, the fire only destroyed 10% of the Stanley Hotel, while the fire and the, and the Earls destroyed the entire hotel. Gotcha. And so really what you're saying too, it's like they didn't just build the hotel, but they built like a town nearby. They did, yeah. for like There, was, there were um, a lot of little wooden buildings around the area, but they really built out the town then. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. Yeah. 
So Freeland saw something in Estes Park. He saw a very promising future that nobody else really saw. In fact, in its history, President Theodore Roosevelt stayed at the Stanley Hotel, and so did the Emperor of Japan. Wow. Yeah. I mean, the Emperor of Japan stayed at a hotel in Colorado. Yeah. And Teddy Roosevelt, I mean, he was the one, you know, to really get all the parks going or yeah. help with all of that. And I'm sure he would have loved staying. Oh, yeah. A place I'm like sure that. he would have. Um, so one of the only problems with the Stanley Hotel and Estes Park in general was winter. They were brutal, right? Cars could not get in or out of the area. So the Stanley Hotel closed down every winter. This meant that the hotel, as grand as it was, never made any money. This was okay, though, because Freeland had rather large pockets and no children to leave his money to. But Freeland couldn't support the town and the hotel forever. He was getting older. He was searching for a buyer of the hotel. And in 1930, he found the man to buy it, a man named Roe Emery. Roe Emery was known as the father of Colorado tourism. He owned some lodges, but what really gave him that name is that he had some tour buses that gave tours of the area. Mm. But this alone wasn't enough to help the hotel very much. It struggled to remain open, and in the decades to come, the hotel would change ownership fairly often. Until a certain author stayed at the hotel on September 30th, 1974. It only took Stephen King one night to get the idea for The Shining. King had heard of the hotel from the locals, but also he had heard of Freeland and studied him because King was also from Maine. Oh, I didn't even think about that connection. Yeah. yeah. So King and his wife, Tabitha, stayed there during the start of the, of the winter season. So nobody was in the hotel. We only know about it from the interviews that Stephen King gave. King had free roam of the hotel that night that they were there. King went to the hotel bar where drinks were served by a bartender named Grady. Wow. King and his wife stayed in the hotel room number 217. He said it was how remote the hotel was and its size that really sparked the concept of The Shining. Imagine that you're at this enormous hotel. You go to the dining room and all the chairs were on the tables like they were closed. Except for one table and that is where you ate all your meals. And any music that you heard would echo through the halls. Nobody was there besides a couple of employees. So he recalled going, to, going into the bathroom and pulling back the pink, not green curtain for the tub. And he thought, what if somebody died here? And that was it. He had the book. That's his mind. I mean, like nobody else thinks like, <laughs> yeah, like right? Stephen King. <laughs> so King said, and this is really, this is really odd. Um, King said that he dreamed of my three-year-old son running through the corridors, looking back over his shoulder, eyes wide, screaming. He was being chased by a fire hose. I woke up with a tremendous jerk, sweating all over within an inch of falling out of bed. I got up, lit a, lit a cigarette, sat in a chair looking out the window at the Rockies, and by the time the cigarette was done, I had the bones of The Shining firmly set in my mind. Now, of course, that little boy grew up to be <laughs> also a famous horror writer. I'm not sure which son, but they both are, so that's pretty amazing. But that's crazy how... Uh, it just came, I mean, it was meant to be. Yeah, we know? saw one of his sons at C2E2, yeah, right? Yeah, Joe Hill. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so The Shining was published in 1977 and became the third great success of King's career after Carrie and Salem's Lot. The primary setting is an isolated Colorado resort named the Overlook Hotel, which closes for the winter. In the front cover of the book, King tactfully states some of the most beautiful resort hotels in the world are located in Colorado, but the hotel in these pages is based on none of them. The overlook and the people associated with it exist wholly in the author's imagination. So he lied. <laughs> um, once King admitted that the hotel 
that gave him the inspiration for The Shining was none other than the Stanley Hotel. It gave the hotel some much-needed new tourism. This is when its paranormal life really got started. The reasoning behind Room 217 is that during the fire of 1911 that was caused by the gas backup, since the gas of those days was odorless, you know, we put the odor in there so that it so that we're aware right. that it's there. Uh, the chambermaid got to the room. She lit a lamp, and that is where the explosion started. And she was supposedly knocked from the second floor to the first floor. Mm-hmm. So it was not in room 237, as was in the movie The Shining. The hotel asked King to actually change the name. Oh, or change, change the, the number. number. Yeah, yeah, to change the number. The chambermaid, Mrs. Wilson, is not the scary bathtub ghost from The Shining. In fact, people often say that they will wake up with their rooms cleaned or their clothing folded neatly on the bed. Well, we'll be talking about this. Okay, good. Uh, People believe that the area that the Stanley Hotel was built on holds on to spirits because of all the quartz in the mountains. Uh, Quartz has been known to conduct energy in a way that nothing else can. As of 1983, the hotel has been opened year-round now. Uh, In 1994, Dumb and Dumber was filmed there. Have you ever seen that movie? Yes. Yeah, unfortunately, I've seen it too. In 1997, the Stephen King TV miniseries version of The Shining was filmed there. Yes, good. And Bravo's cooking competition, Top Chef, which I know you're a big fan of, (laughs) uh, also used the Stanley as a venue for episode 10 of season 15, all of which took place in various locations around Colorado. An indie rock band, Murder by Death, has performed an annual series of winter concerts at the Stanley Hotel since 2014, with the 2020 edition being their seventh such event. So do you have anything to add, Rebecca? Yeah, a few things. You know, one thing I just wanted to say um, in general is that The Shining, and you kind of, you know, I think we're saying this is, but just to reiterate that the stories... The ghost stories from the Shining or from the Stanley Hotel are not the stories from The Shining. Well, not necessarily, but the room two thirty seven was supposed to be room te- two seventeen, which was part of the stories. Absolutely, that's the one. And and there's a few. I mean, you can. I guess I'll say this: you can. You'll hopefully be able to see with the ghost stories that we talk about how they could be inspirational to a writer. But there, he definitely didn't just take them from the hotel or no, verbatim. No, he invented them. You know, and he never claimed to experience anything paranormal there himself. No. Directly at all. So just, you know, want to put nope, that out there. But there was another famous person. That... There was. So I just wanted to mention, because you just mentioned Jim Carrey and Dumber and Dumber. So there is an apocryphal story, right? So this is a story that just it's one of those ones that people always tell, but there's mm-hmm. no like evidence for it of any kind um, that Jim Carrey stayed in room 217 during the filming of Dumb and Dumber, but ran out, like literally ran Mm -hmm. (laughs) out after just a few hours and refused to return. And he would only come back to the hotel like to film. Like he would come right when it was time to film and leave right after and has never spoken of what he saw or what happened. Well, Jim Carrey, if you'd like to call into the show, we will... <laughs> we'd love to hear. Yeah, we'd love to hear why. <laughs> um, and then I also just wanted to give actually a special shout out to uh, one of our listeners, Alice. Alice. Um, and she sent us a really awesome YouTube series that documents uh, this. It's um, a paranormal investigation, series of paranormal investigations, and it includes a few um, by the band Murder by Death that you yeah. just mentioned. Yep. They're a part of it. It's called Spirits of the Stanley, and it's on the Dark Zone Network on YouTube. I will absolutely put a link, of course, in the show notes. And it, like I said, it was made by, they kind of have like paranormal people on staff at the Stanley Hotel. Um, they do. And this particular group was there, I believe, from 2009 to 2016. They did this thing with the band, and those particular episodes have a lot of really creepy stuff. Uh, and 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 so, just wanted to mention it as something worth watching. You know, we're going to stick a little bit more general today because I want everybody to hear kind of the main stories of the hotel. Um, but uh, we might hear some of the 
some of the thoughts from from those episodes coming up today. But I just want to thank you, Alice, for sharing that. And we love it when you guys send us evidence yeah. of things that we're going to be talking about. So when you see that post about what's coming up or we mention it at the end of the episode, if you find an article or know of something and you want to share it with us, we'd love it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I do want to note that not only do they have a a team of paranormal investigators that work there or currently work there, I'm not sure how that works, um, but they also have a psychic that works there. They do. He's kind of like Jacob a little bit where he's definitely a show person. Like he'll do a big oh, I show. I saw a female. Oh, the one I saw was a, again, I think they hire different, you know, yeah, it's maybe. probably been different people over the years. Um, but yeah, they definitely do a show and, and bring up a lot. Actually, I'm going to say the one article I found, the the psychic that they had, or sorry, the, the well, psychic, I guess, um, was actually sharing some items from the Titanic. Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, but then they also do nightly tours. Yeah. Go tours. The Murder by Death band that goes and plays there, uh, the concert that they give is for people that believe in the paranormal. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah. So I thought that was really interesting. Yeah. Um, okay, well, uh, we should probably take a break and then we will get right back in to the debate. Let's do it. All right. Listeners, did you know there's a way to share with the world whether you're a hashtag team believer or hashtag team skeptic, or for those who need it, hashtag team the middle? It's our store called Ghostly Gear. Yep. And we even have custom ghostly designs like Microclimate or even the Easter Island Massacre or of the Ghostly logo. Just visit our Ghostly Gear store right on ghostlypodcast.com to order your t-shirt, hoodie, mug, mask, whatever. <laughs> okay, okay. I think we got it. Um, they they just need to visit ghostlypodcast.com and click on Ghostly Gear to order right on the website and send us any ideas that you have for new merch. Exactly. Order your merch today and send us a pic of you in your ghostly gear. Right, we're back for the great debate. It's time. Rebecca, are you ready? I am. Okay, let's go. Well, I wanted to start by just saying there are so many ghost sightings at the Stanley Hotel, and there's just no way for us to talk about all of them. Right. All of the evidence, all of the sightings. Because there's like 12 ghosts there, right? There's a lot. I, 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 I have not heard a count. I, I've heard 12. Okay. Well, I just, and I know lots of TV shows and paranormal investigators have gone there and uh, Has Zach know. Baggins been there? Oh, yeah. Oh, my favorite. Something about a levitating table. I don't even know. There's so many yeah. things. But, you know, our job is is to give you the, you know, the the regular stories, the ones that you hear most often. The most right? general. The most general stories. Yeah. And and not that we're going to talk not talk about some specific things as well, but I want to make sure that, you know, you leave with understanding the the traditional ghost stories that happen <laughs> uh, at the hotel. And I also just wanted to mention one thing that's a little different about the Stanley Hotel is that there really hasn't been any reports of extra deaths at the hotel. Or crazy unusual deaths. Yeah. There's no like, oh, she jumped from the balcony and, you know, or or the, you know, whatever, even the woman, and we're certainly going to talk about, you mentioned the the housemaid that fell from the second floor to the first yeah. floor. She lived. Yeah. You know, I mean, there's not <laughs> like she a lived, lot of... She lived in and worked there into her 90s. Yeah. She kept working there. It was great. She loved the place. Yeah. And yeah. so really what people will say is that a lot of the hauntings there are not necessarily negative feeling. I mean, okay. some of them are certainly scary. And sometimes people will say they feel kind of dark or oppressive feelings. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, there really isn't... Um, the same kind of feeling, I guess, that it, there are at some other places. Okay. And also, uh, you know, I, I guess the theory, and we will certainly debate this as we go, um, is that it's really not about like someone died and so they stayed there. 
It's that they were at the hotel and have happy memories there. Okay. And are drawn back to it when they die. Mm. So just kind of have that in your mind as we're talking about stuff. Interesting. Okay. Okay. So the first main ghost that always gets mentioned is Freeland Stanley himself. Mm. So after he passed away in 1940, there have been, or ever since then, um, there have been reports of his spirit throughout the hotel, specifically in the billiard room and at the bar. Um, I've also heard multiple reports of him uh, being seen as the doorman uh, or even at the registration desk. People will report about the excellent service that they've received from the man in the bowler hat, but there is no doorman in a bowler hat that works there. Hmm. There is also reports of people seeing him on the stairway. Okay. Yeah. So lots of sightings of Freeland Stan- Stanley around the hotel. Okay. So what I would say about this is uh, we have to go with the easiest possible answer for these things. Um, And the easiest possible answer is that they're mistaken or that somebody put on the hat, you know, or whatever. Although, you know, the billiards room would have been a room that he loved to hang out in because he loved billiards. Mm -hmm. Um, But um, the idea is Occam's razor. Have you ever heard of that? Oh, yeah. We've talked about that. So it's a principle from philosophy. Uh, Suppose that there exist two explanations for an occurrence. In this case, the one that requires the smallest number of assumptions is usually correct. Another way of saying it is that the more assumptions you have to make, the more unlikely an explanation. So if if we're assuming that this is him, that is a big jump. And what I'm just saying is that the easiest possible solution is that they're mistaken. I guess for me, I will just say the sheer number of people throughout the years that have made these claims is a big part of what makes it interesting to me. Well, I might have more of an answer for that one in another bit of evidence that we have. Well, and and that makes sense because honestly, that's really the kind of the case with all of these is yeah. just that there's so many reports of them. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so what would you rate your evidence? This one I'm going to give a six. Okay. Because there's not really quite as much specific story, many specific stories, though yeah. the doorman one is definitely what helped push it up to a six for me. Okay. How about for you? Maybe a one. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Oh. For, okay. Probably more of a zero, but I'm going to go up to a one, I <laughs> you're, guess. You're you going to start at a one? Yeah, start okay. at a one. <laughs> All right. You ready for another one? Yes, I am. Okay. Another area of the hotel that often reports a lot of spiritual activity is the concert hall. So uh, it was built for Flora Stanley, Freeland's wife, right? She liked mm-hmm. to play music and uh, it's a really, like, it's a true concert hall. Like, it has... Um, like trap doors and things like that that you can use they like to, to do a performance. Uh, but in there, people report hearing the piano or seeing keys move without anyone there. And they kind of assume that it's his wife. Uh, one post that I found that I thought was interesting was uh, a blog where he described his experience at the concert hall. Uh, and he said that while he did not hear the piano, he did feel something. He said, the moment I stepped into the empty hall, I nearly immediately felt weighed down and had a bit of trouble breathing as if the air was thick with smog. Then as soon as we got outside, that heavy feeling completely disappeared. Okay. So for this one, I'm going to say that it's very interesting. Um, The hotel has pretty much not made much money since since it was created. Um, And... Oftentimes, it's exchanged hands. In fact, the last time, it it was at a bankruptcy au- auction. Oh, wow. That the new owner um, received the hotel. Now, he bought it for $500,000, which is the exact amount that it cost them to build it in 1911. So, I mean, that was a steal, right? Um, but he had to turn it into a profit maker. And I believe he's the one that started having it open year round, Mm. which added to it. Although the winter months definitely are slower for them. Oftentimes they don't even have anybody. And it was in 1983 that they opened it up year round or after 1983. I can't remember if it was 1983 or 1984. 
Uh, so the Stanley Hotel is more successful as a tourist destination than as a hotel. Did you know that? Oh, yeah. Well, elk season is huge yeah. there. People come to see the, the elk. Uh, the staff conducts daily ghost tours, mm-hmm. attracting a staggering 500 visitors every single day for their, for their ghost tours. Uh, these people visit for a hunting experience. <laughs> so I think that they, they come there with the expectation that they are going to hear something. And the older the room and the more history that the room has, like the concert hall, the more likely they are to believe that there is some kind of experience there. So I believe that they're paying to go there and that's what they want to see. Just like I've said this often in our, in our episodes, but this one, I have actual proof that now they get 500 visitors a day just for their paranormal um, ghost tours. Mm -hmm. But I guess I will say part of that though, is that, I mean, the paranormal experiences have happened for a while. Since 1974. No, even before that, there were reports of people seeing Freeland around. Um, and I would say that, you know, it's one of those things like you it's a chicken or egg situation. Did the paranormal visitors start coming because there's paranormal activity there? Or did the paranormal activity start because people started to go there? Well, my research says that pretty much really the paranormal experiences started happening after 1974. After Stephen King stayed Well, there. 79 is when the book came out. Uh, okay. 77, <laughs> actually. Oh, 77. That's right. Yeah. yeah. But still, I mean, it was after they knew that Stephen King was there. You know, I, I don't know. I'm just saying. So what's so, your rating then? Oh, I'm going to give this one a zero. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm going to give this one a seven. Actually, no, I take that back. I am going to give this one an eight. An eight. Yes, wow. because this feeling of this feeling like the air being thick and really heavy um, is one that is reported often at the hotel. And I, you know, there's just it, that is a, the most common thing. It's it kind of goes with the idea of the courts that you've mm-hmm. been talking about, that there's just a lot of energy that is there. And, you know, whether it's manifesting in actually Mrs. Freeland, I don't know. But there's definitely things going on there. But my question to you is, why do we attribute this heavy feeling to paranormal? Well, because they haven't been able to find any other explanation. I mean, if there was weird carbon monoxide or something that was like causing people to feel that, I would imagine they would have figured that out by now. Hmm. They would not let that just be there. Yeah. Well, I might have more information about that. Okay. Okay. (laughs) <laughs> All right. What's your next piece of evidence? All right. So third one is actually going back to a story that you had earlier. Okay. Um, which was about Mrs. Wilson. Mm-hmm. So we, you know, you told us the story of how she was. <laughs> uh, now the story I read was that she was lighting the lanterns in the room to two seventeen when one exploded. But I, that makes sense that it was when they were testing, you know, the new system. No, no, no. That they were. It was put to the test. Put to the test. By the electricity going out. Oh, gotcha. So she went in there to light the lanterns and yeah. bam, gotcha. Um, so she was seriously injured. She didn't die. As you mentioned, she recovered and kept working. Um, she died years later in town. Um, and since her death, though, people have reported things happening in that room. Uh, items are moved or, as you mentioned, organized. Like, I love that. Like, what a friendly ghost mm-hmm. <laughs> that she, like, packs things or, like, cleans up the the items left in the bathroom, <laughs> you know, like, just kind of organizes things. Sometimes lights go on and off. Um, she kind of helps you with packing, that kind of stuff. Uh, but I will say the one story that comes out that's, I guess, not as, as handy um, is that she doesn't, uh, supposedly doesn't like unmarried couples because they report feeling like a cold presence between them while they're in bed if they're in that room. Interesting. Uh, Okay. Well, I'm going to use the same explanation that I would use for room 401 for this one. Okay. So I read in the Skeptical Inquirer, which I love that website. 
Um, and we'll link it in the show notes, of course. Um, I read a great article um, where these people that um, are pretty much, what they do is they go about finding paranormal areas and disproving the paranormal, which is just fascinating to me. I love it. Um, but they they uh, actually did a whole thing about Room 401 that kind of relates to this. So they um, they feel that paranormal investigators have all this scientific equipment, but they do not use it in a scientific way. Um, you know, that's up to debate, I guess, for that one. But uh, so what they do is they bring that same scientific equipment in and use it to disprove. So what they did was um, they measured the vibrations in the hotel. What is it, a seismic? Seismograph. Seismograph, yeah, something like that. And um, they determined that the hotel, especially um, on, on the fourth floor, uh, had a lot of vibrations caused from it being around the mountains. And it can actually be as physically manifesting as moving stuff in the room. It could actually, you put something on top of a table, you next thing you know, it's on the floor. You know, um, so I believe it's kind of the same thing. I believe that its area on the mountains give it this kind of heavy feeling too. And this feeling of this seismic energy that's going off there, which a lot of people can attribute to ghosts, but it could be just because it's on like a fault line or something. Uh, so that's what I'm going to say for that. Also, um, I don't necessarily believe that this was M- Mrs. Wilson's actual room. No, I think she just was work. This is where she had her big accident. But I mean, why would she start in the middle of the hotel to light the lanterns when actually they were lighting lanterns down um, in the lobby? Because that's where they brought everyone together. And none of the guests had any problems. But then when they went up to room 217, all of the gas seemed to float into that particular room. Ghosts. No, I, <laughs> I, no, I mean, but I don't know. But I just know that, I mean, why would her presence be drawn there? Because that's where she had a big event in her life. I mean, I don't know why the gas blew up in that room. Again, it paranormal also, or not, I don't know. Also, she harbored no bad feelings towards the hotel for for that occurrence and nope. loved being there. Loved being there. That's what I said at the very beginning of when we started this debate is that it is not about like someone having a horrible, tragic death and yeah. therefore being stuck there. It is loving being there so much that that is where they go yeah, and where they're drawn to. And I, I again, seismic activity, I think that is a that is definitely something then that any paranormal researchers that are working there should take into account. Um, I don't think that explains people folding clothes. Okay. Or things being more organized. I just think that they don't realize that they've done that already. That's creepy. Well, I mean, there's times, you know, especially when you're on vacation, you're not thinking about every single thing and you might start to bring out your clothes and not realize that you even started because you get taken away by something. You know, it's like, ooh, let's go down to the pool or let's do this or that or the game room. But why? I would love the game room. I'm sure you would. But I don't know why people wouldn't report that from other rooms then. They probably do. What's really interesting about the hotel is that they say, um, the skeptics say, that um, when when asked what is the most haunted room in the hotel, besides 217 and 401, they will, uh, they will often say the one that they need to rent out the most. So it changes every day ah. based upon the, what their needs are. <laughs> and these uh, skeptics actually did this thing. Did you hear the uh, story about they were doing a um, EMF on top of a guy once? And like when they started to do it, he like started to like do like a trance or something like that. Like he was um, he he was like having convulsions and stuff, acting like he was possessed. Well, what's interesting is that they say that these EMIs often give off electricity based upon people and not on paranormal things. 
well, you know, again, lots of different thoughts on it. Yeah. So I'm going to rate this one a zero. Okay. All right. I'm going to give this one a seven. A seven. Yeah. Wow. Again, lots of reports over the years, this room in particular. Um, you know, it, it definitely seems like like something. Okay. All right. Uh, so I'm going to go to the Grand Staircase mm. as another very popular uh, paranormal area. It is often referred to as the Vortex mm. um, because it's believed to be a conduit for paranormal activity throughout the hotel. Actually, the the idea of Vortex, mm-hmm. it got its name because somebody, um, somebody was taking pictures of a doorknob. And the doorknob, it, like in every picture, the color was different. Oh, I did not see those. So that's why they, they started calling it the Vortex. Okay. Yeah. Okay, anyways, go ahead. Uh, so um, people reported feeling cold spots, being dizzy. Um, I also found several photographs that people have taken on the staircase of ghosts. Um, the one I thought was the most interesting was one of a small girl. It was taken in 2017 by a family taking the night spirit tour. They did not notice the girl in the image until the next day when they were reviewing their images. Uh, they asked other people who were on the tour if anyone remembered this girl, but no one did. Um, and she she doesn't look like like a full corporal being. I mean, she definitely looks kind of ghostly in the picture. Um, and uh, one interesting quote that I found from um, the website Our Own Community uh, was, quote, some people think the photo has been doctored. Others believe in the ghostly legend surrounding the building. In fact, a former FBI agent didn't completely rid off the image as fake. It ranks up there as one of the best photos of paranormal evidence I've seen. If it's faked, I've got to hand it to them for their level of detail and creativity because there's usually enough easy signs to suggest host- hoaxing. So, yeah, I, I mean, you sent me the picture and I happened to look at it. And the first thing that um, that I saw that really caught my eye is that nobody around the area seemed at all taken by this. So they didn't see it physically with their eyes. No. That's what I'm assuming from that. If they did, they just, you know, are so used to ghosts that they didn't care. But I'm sure that that wasn't, that wasn't the case. But they, um, so nobody really seemed to be, in, be, be interested in this. So this has to be just the photo, right? Mm-hmm. And photos have this way of of capturing other things and they could malfunction. I bet these people took hundreds of photos that day and had to look through all of them and then found this one that had it. And to me, it doesn't even look like a girl. Really. Oh, for me, it totally does. It was to super, me, it looks uh, like almost obvious that it It does. looks like it could be a lamp. No. It does to me. On the f- step? Like, yeah, no, I don't. I, I know the location is wrong, mm-hmm. but it looks like lampish to me. I'm just saying. Um, so what I think happened is I think this is a overexposure or a um, or a leaking of another photo into that one, or maybe that they took multiple photos and now uh, cameras, especially like the iPhones and stuff like that, uh, have this HDR fi- um, feature where it takes like multiple pictures, three or more. And then it makes it into one image, the best image that the software thinks. I believe it's just a malfunction. I believe it's it's I believe it's a cell phone picture first of all, uh, and I also believe it's the software picking the best image and it's overlapping different things. All right. Well, I will put the photo, of course, in the show notes for everyone to take a look at and yeah. make their own judgment of what they think. But I would also like to mention um, that this could be a case of um, paradelia. Mm. You know, that is um, where we have a tendency for incorrect perception of a stimulus as objects, patterns, or meanings known by known to the observer. So common examples are perceived images of animals, faces, or objects in cloud formations. So it's just like that same thing where you look up and you see a cloud and you say, wow, that looks like Ronald Reagan. You know, I believe it's it's <laughs> us. <laughs> it was. But I believe it's us just putting these kind of uh, image values to these things that don't really have image values. 
Yeah, I don't, I know, to me, this is so clearly a girl that I, it, it doesn't feel like that to me, but we will leave it up to uh, to the listeners. It's a lamp. <laughs> All right, so your vote is zero. rating zero. All right, yeah. for me, this one's a seven. Okay. All right, so we are to our last piece of evidence. Um, Wait, I would like to question oh, yeah. your seven there, though. Oh, sure. Because in the other one, you gave eight. Right. You I, were really strongly. I was. And that had no evidence, no photographic evidence. It just had people talking about it. Right. I guess for me, the... The fact that that feeling uh-huh. is the most common report of okay. people. And in fact, there was a story that unfortunately we were not given permission to share on this episode. Mm. So I'm not going to tell the story. But one of the main pieces of evidence in that story was someone feeling that really just not okay feeling um, okay. in the hotel. And I and again, there's been other and, and just again, that's a common thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so to me, that's more more believable than one photo. Sure. Right. Again, I think this is a pretty convincing photo, especially with an FBI person saying, like, I can't see an obvious fake part of this. They didn't say they totally believed it either. Well, but- we, d- we don't know if he was an FBI agent that was like, that this is what he did was disprove images. He could have been an FBI field agent that goes out in the field and runs missions and does stuff like that, that happens to be like, I don't know. That looks believable to me. No, he said that, that he couldn't find any obvious n- things of, I mean, it sound. I don't know, whatever. It sounds like somebody that knows what they're talking yeah. about. I mean. But I was just questioning that. And so you're saying that the amount of people that experience it is what gave you the eight in the other one and seven in this one. Right. And okay. I th- yes. I'm just, just trying to gauge it. That's all. Right. And it isn't something that, like you said, in the photo, it is clear. And no, you know, and when they interviewed people after, it wasn't like people were like, oh, yeah, I saw that girl on the stairs. Like it was truly just in this one photo. Yeah. So it's a thing, but not as believable as the okay. people that have that feeling. All right. All right. So. Uh, last last section here. Now, I have to say there are so many more ghosts that we are not able to talk about. Like there, Lucy. Lucy is Lucy is, is one. If you if you listen to the series that um, that I'll link to from Alice, um, they talk a lot about Lucy, who's a ghost in the basement of the concert hall. Mm-hmm. But honestly, I cannot find a lot of other reports of this ghost other than that particular team sure they cl- there's a there's some or people sp- that have been on their tour or yeah something. i yeah. mean there's there's people that talk about a, a, a it's either a teenager or a girl um that somehow was either staying in the basement or got lost in the basement um but historians cannot find there's no evidence of this ever okay. happening so to me eh, i'm not sure you know all right because um, we can't find the body so, so there was no murder. <laughs> no, again, no one reports of any deaths yeah, or anything. Yeah. Um, but there is actually, you mentioned how there's so many different other buildings mm-hmm. as part of this system. Um, there's actually even a pet cemetery wow. on the property because there's so many people that work there and, and whatever. Um, and Wait, so I wonder if that's where Stephen King got I the idea. Know. I know. I was like, that's so great. <laughs> um, so I wanted to just mention that there's a lot of stories of, of pets and um, and their ghosts. Um, there's also, you mentioned um, the manor. There yeah. is also, there is a lady in green at the Not manor. Not in white. Not in white, in oh, green okay. at the manor. But I thought, okay, I need to make some sort of call here. <laughs> so we're going to stick to the main hotel property. Okay. You know, the, the proper hotel. Um, and I think... Proper. We, pro, hotel proper. Um, so I don't think we can, we can finish, uh, as you've been mentioning, um, the fourth floor is like they will... Anybody that you talk to will say the most haunted place in the whole, mm-hmm. whole hotel is the fourth floor. Yeah, um, I, and, I heard one thing where they said... Go on the fourth floor, which is, they said, the longest floor. Yes, which okay. is weird to think about. Yeah, um, and they said, walk down the fourth floor, and by the time that you get to the end of the fourth floor and turn around, you will have a paranormal experience. Wow. That's what they said. Yeah. So I found that interesting. It, that is interesting. Well, part of it is that used to be the the floor for children. Oh, and women okay. and the nannies. 
Okay. So, uh, so I guess, you know, that energy is there. Um, so, oh, sorry, female employees, I should say, not mm. just all women, but female employees, children and nannies. Um, and so that is where you will hear the most reports of children running around, um, laughing, giggling, playing. Um, and that the room 401 that you mentioned is, um, I guess, maybe a main one where people think that there's a closet that kind of opens and closes on its own. Um, 428 is where people think there's people, I mentioned this in my ghost story, where there's they hear people walking above it. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I, but I would just say in general, this is, oh, and there's also supposedly a cowboy in room 428 Whoa. Uh, mm-hmm. that sits in the, a friendly cowboy that sits in the corner. Uh, is that but, the room you want? No. No. <laughs> yeah, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not the cowboy type. You know? Oh, okay. Uh, but a- anyways, just in general, though, I would say the fourth floor, lots of reports of children mm-hmm. running around, laughing, giggling, playing around. Um, you know, and what's also really interesting in the history of it is that, um, so when Freeland first opened up the hotel, it was a very high-end hotel, and people would come and bring their servants with them. Oh, sure. That would make sense. And so their servants would stay up there with the kids and their nannies and all those things. So it was because of its early history. Yeah. Um, So, yeah, that's pretty interesting. Uh, One thing I will note is um, that the owner of the hotel, or I think he's called the president of something. If it's a corporation, that would make sense. Uh, He... um, so when he bought it for the $500,000, he didn't have the money. He had $50,000 in the bank. And it happened that he needed to put a deposit down of 57000 So he borrowed $7,000 off of his credit card. So could you imagine? He started this place. He, I mean, he took over this place by paying $57,000. Wow. And that was it. And this place is ginormous. Yeah. Well, I mean, my guess is it has to cost a lot of money to run, especially because it's oh, not yeah. easy to get to. So like anything that has to get there. Well, really, it was a failed business up until he took over and uh, opened it up year round and started the paranormal investigations and started the psychic thing where people were staying there already because of Stephen King. And, um, you know, they were... Um, they were amassing this like paranormal group that was there, but they weren't like doing anything for them. They were just letting them stay there and letting them wander around the hotel. That was like their whole experience. Now they brought them this experience where they have entertainment for that. But I think it's just that. I think it's entertainment. As the president or the owner, whatever he's called, states he's never seen a spirit there. And of all the people that would have seen it, you would think it would be him. You'd think he probably spends the most amount of time there, right? I don't know. Depends how hands-on of an owner he is. He seems pretty hands-on, and they love him, too. Mm -hmm. The psychic loved him, too, and the thing that I was watching. Mm -hmm. Um, But very interesting. He said he's never seen anything. Uh, Kind of wink, wink, wink to the camera kind of thing where um, you know, he says he's not going to tell uh, the guests that they didn't see something. Mm -hmm. So I believe that this is all part of this president owner guy's plan to make money on this hotel. And it's okay. It's okay to make money on a hotel, right? It's okay to make money using the paranormal. I just just fear that people are walking away from this mistaking uh, orbs and other things as being ghosts and... They really believe this. And I don't know if there's any harm to that or foul to that. I I think that in this kind of situation, I don't feel that there is any, but I feel like when they go home, that's where the harm and the foul is. If they keep believing in these kind of things and then they they invest more into it, that's where I feel the harm and foul is. Mm-hmm. I think it's... I think it's amazing how many people have reported things there. I think that there's are stories of the people reporting, 
you know, complaining that there's children running around or they hear the laughing or hearing things above them. And there's just no way for that to have happened. Now, some of that, uh, now that you've explained about the seismic activity, I could see some of that, like I hear somebody walking above me or things like that. I could I could see that being maybe the explanation. Um, but again, to me, it's the it's the sheer number mm-hmm. of people that have reported and not all of them have even been aware of all the paranormal. I think I think more recently it's a little harder to avoid, um, but it has not always been, well, been that also, way. Also, the room 401 is right off the elevator. And what the skeptics noticed was that the elevator itself was causing a rattling or vibration that in itself was loud enough to hear. So anytime the elevator was used, they were they were hearing this weird rattling noise, but they were able to trace it to the elevator itself. Yeah. Well, I will say all the paranormal investigators I watched, you know, they especially because they're there a lot. They're like, we know the regular sounds and they can kind of dismiss like, oh, that's like the normal sound of this. I was also impressed. This was on the the Alice's set of videos. There was one point where they, with the band, where there were doors that flew open Mm -hmm. and freaked everybody out. But when they went back and looked at the evidence and really looked at the videos, they clearly saw or heard wind. Yeah. A weird gust of wind and that that was what had opened the doors. And, you know, that always impresses me and makes it me believe some of their other evidence more because they clearly really want to work hard at disproving anything. I think that's why they do it. <laughs> Again, to there's gain no, your trust. there is no amount of evidence. <laughs> hey, the last episode I gave an overall rating of three. <laughs> All uh, right. So for, what's your evidence for the fourth floor or what's your rating for the fourth floor? Uh, let's go one. Okay. I'm going to go, uh, I'm going to go for another uh, seven on this one. Seven. Yeah. Okay. So overall, what is your rating? I'm going to say a seven. Okay. Uh, I really do think that um, that it's that it's got something going on. I, I don't know about all these individual ghosts for sure uh, without going there myself. Uh, but I do think that there is some that spirits are drawn there and that there's definitely some some paranormal things that happen. There's just too many stories that go with that. Hmm. So how about for you? What's your overall rating? I'm going to go a one. Uh, even though we can explain most of the things, and I think I've done a good job explaining most of the things, I, I believe that uh, there is an energy there, and I just don't believe it has anything to do with the dead or paranormal. I believe that energy is um, from the atmosphere there. It's like an atmospheric energy. Uh, and I believe that, you know, like when you go... You know, I'm a city boy, and uh, when I'd go out to the country and spend the night in a country house, I would sleep better than ever. That's something different. That's an energy that's there. It's not paranormal at all. It's because the wind is clearer or whatever, or the air is purer or whatever. But there is something. You know what I'm saying? Actually, I'd, I'd actually think that you'd have a harder time sleeping in the quiet or the weird other, the weird sounds of the... <laughs> of, well, sleeping, the, the sleeping, country. sleeping in me don't necessarily work all the time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I wanted to actually uh, something that's not the Stanley episode. I wanted to talk about something, mm. uh, something personal to you, Rebecca. Uh oh, you had said that you're experiencing some paranormal activity in your laundry room. Oh, that is true. I kind of forgot about that. And I had promised a listener that we were going to talk about it in oh, this episode. Oh, okay. So. We're going to throw that in here before throw our closing arguments. Yep. Okay. Yep. Uh, okay. So this has been a few weeks now. I have to remember. Okay. So, okay. I went up. Okay. I put, in a, put a load in the dryer. I went back, you know, whatever, an hour later to get it out. And the door of the dryer was open. And the clothes were not fully dry. They were like partially dry. Okay. So that was weird Uh because I asked the only other person in the house if they had done it and they assured me they had not. Uh Um, So that was weird. 
But I will say there was a part of me that's like, hey, maybe the dryer overheated and there's some sort of automatic thing that it like opens the door and stops it. I mean, I've never heard of that before and, and I have not had that problem since then. But OK, fine. Uh, and then the other thing was um, that uh, I have like the the thing with the actual um, detergent, you know, on top of the washer. And I came back in uh, again to to move laundry, switch laundry. And it was totally in a weird place that I never put it and the cap was off. Uh, and again, yes, totally possible that that was me that I had left the cap off and, and or the washer moved and it moved it. But I've never had that happen. But is that a typical kind of thing that that Rebecca would do? Uh no. Accidentally leaving the lid off of the... But I have like a vivid memory of putting <laughs> it back on. Like it was a really weird thing. It is, I guess it is a Rebecca thing that I could leave off the thing. But it, again, it was just in a really weird place mm. and it didn't really make much sense to Now, me. you blamed this on us doing ghostly. <laughs> No. You did. You said it was really? ghostly. And because we've we've woken up all these spirits, especially with the Shadow People episode. Well, that's true. That where I creep- asked them to come visit that us. That was creeping me out. Yeah, yeah. Well, again, I like I'm I firmly, you know, there are absolutely explanations for it, but it was really weird. It was just it happened over a couple of days. Hasn't happened again since then. Um, but I'm keeping my eye out. All right, keep us posted. All right. On the paranormal activity in your laundry room. There you go. <laughs> um, so that brings us to the closing arguments. This is our last chance to convince you to vote our way. We are each given one minute of uninterrupted time. We will time each other on our cell phones to keep Rebecca honest. Hey. Rebecca, are you ready? Yes. All right. And let's go. All right. I believe that the Stanley Hotel is haunted. Uh, I believe that Stephen King, even if he didn't see anything specific, felt it when he was there. Um, I do think that there is a lot going on with energy um, when people talk about the area with the the quartz and the limestone. Um, there are, again, there's more stories there that we didn't even have time for today. Um, but the the sheer number of stories that have happened over the years, the sheer number of people who call down reporting things who leave in the middle of the night. And the the people are just like, yep, okay. You know, I mean, like Jim Carrey is the one story that that we talked about today, but but he is not the only one. Um, and, and again, just the the sheer, as I've said over and over again today, the sheer number of reports uh, just make it where I I have to believe. I mean, I can't say all those people are, are wrong. I, I can't. All right. All right. You ready? I am ready. Okay. And go. So I believe that it's not haunted. The reason I believe it's not haunted is because it's a money maker. It's a cash cow. It is. It has gained in popularity since Stephen King was there, of course. And because they know that it was based upon, that the movie The Shining is based upon the Stanley Hotel, we assume that there is something there. These 500 people a day that go to visit there and spend all their money, I'm sure that they want to get something out of it. And they're happy with anything that they get out of it. It takes all kinds to fill this world. And I believe that the... Tales of the haunted stuff are the exaggerated few that stay there. And I'm done. Wow. All right. Now, I would also like to just say that The Shining is a book. I mean, yes, yes, it is a movie. (laughs) It is a book. But it is a book. And the book is very good. And Dr. Sleep, which is the sequel that just came out a few years ago, is also very good. I actually like Dr. Sleep better than The Shining. Okay, it was. I, I was surprised because I you never know with sequels. I'm a Ewan McGregor fan. Well, I'm a Stephen King fan, and I think he did a great job. Okay, <laughs> uh, so I want to thank you so much for listening. Please share us with your friends and family, as word of mouth is our best form of advertisement. Remember to hit that subscribe button if you haven't yet done so. Uh, if you're on YouTube, please smash the like button. <laughs> uh, we will be talking about Notre Dame on the next episode that comes out on March 17th. Uh, Irish? 
theme, yeah. maybe? <laughs> the Fighting Irish? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and it comes out on St. Paddy's Day. There it is. Uh, Patrick really likes St. Patrick's Day, in case you... It's my namesake day. (laughs) Haven't uh, noticed that yet. Yeah. um, But we are not going to be talking about Notre Dame. We're going to be talking about Notre Dame. Right. The American University. University, yes. yes, Of the Fighting Irish. (laughs) Fighting Irish. Yeah. So I'm really excited about that episode. Uh, I, You know, a listener actually recommended it. And uh, ever since then, I've been fascinated with the idea of there being a paranormal side to Notre Dame. There you go. Again, send us your your uh, ideas. Send us your yeah. ghost stories. Send us your ideas. We, we love uh, to hear them. And if you have anything about Notre Dame, send it to us so we can use it in our next episode and we'll give you cred. Absolutely. We'll give you street cred for that <laughs> stuff. Uh, but until next time, stay ghostly. Bye.